Jesus, please take us from this grandstand world. It's time we got into the game. We're so tired of this grandstand world where feelings never seem to change. Welcome to another episode of Leaving the Grandstand World Live. I'm Vic Zarley. As you probably know if you've seen any of my other uh, podcasts of Leaving the Grandstand World. Today, I would like to share a couple of articles. I wanted to share, too, that it seems that when I write... I have a broader vocabulary and a greater grasp of things. When I speak, I just don't feel like I have that pizzazz. And I believe the pizzazz comes from God. Uh, that's why I like to read what I've written to you and that sort of up, ups my confidence and uh, makes me feel like I'm sharing something worthwhile. I hope one day the Lord will bless me to where I can speak with the same sense of authority that comes from Jesus, the same sense of, of a broader vocabulary that seems to come only when I write. I hope one day I'll, I'll have that when I speak. I would ask that you pray for me. That would be great. Meanwhile, today I have two writings that I'd like to share with you. The first one is entitled, Too Much Security, with a question mark. Too much security? And in this world, if we have too much security, we're going to feel like this is our home. And that's dangerous. This is not our home. Our home is, is in heaven. So we really can't get too comfortable in this arena. And so we, I discussed that in this first, this first article. The second article or, or writing that I want to share with you is called The Redemptive Lie. And you will understand what that means by the time I finish sharing it. Meanwhile, you just relax and uh, know that the answer is coming on the redemptive lie. What could that possibly be? So here's too much security. For some reason, I am feeling secure. In this world, that is dangerous. We cannot afford the luxury of feeling secure in the world. Our only security is in God, and when the dust cloud of the world gets too thick and we see no supernatural deity in which we can rest, it is time to be concerned. O oh, Heavenly Father, descend on me like you did on your Son. Help me humbly walk in the way you would have me go. If I become secure in the world and cannot see you, remove the dust particles that keep my eyes from focusing on you. Take away my sense of security that I may humbly bow to you. Tune my ears that I might hear your still small voice and give me the strength and the power and the fortitude to follow through on your commands. Right now, I sense two kinds of fear. The first one, the fear that appearances bring, such as disease, poverty, and broken relationships. And the second one is the fear that comes from resting in the world, a fear that seems to have no cause because the world is constantly blinding my eyes to the truth of my disabilities. This is when I swim in my own pool, live by my own strength, am rewarded 
for my own work and feel all is well. Father, relieve me from my sense of security. In a wild dichotomy, help me see that I can't see. Help me know that on my own, I can't know. Help me feel the truth that without you, I'm numb and growing number. What do I do in place of being still and knowing God is God? It's almost as if the world has tentacles like an octopus and it is constantly putting distractions into my mind. Do this. No, do that. Think about this instead. You don't need to dwell on God. Dwell on me instead one tentacle after another, pushing and probing its way into the crevices of my heart and mind, never letting up, not even for a second, always coming at me, distracting, distracting, distracting. No, I say, I will be still. Now. Mind, stop now paying attention to those worldly distractions. You are avoiding the treasures God is holding for you in heaven. You seek for pennies when millions await you. You seek for dust when diamonds by the wheelbarrow full are just beyond. You seek for the trivial when the real wants your mind and heart. Gladly release the world and its distractions. Gladly hand over the reins of this horrible stallion of deception you have been riding since you were born. No longer do you wish to try to tame it and make it take you to seek the empty treasures of the world. Dismount now and run sobbing and humble to your father who loves you so much. He has given you free will and though it appears he has never tried to rescue you from your own misdirected desires, he did send his son to die for you. Run to him. He loves you so much. That's the first one called Too Much Security. And now, the redemptive lie. What could that possibly mean? Let's find out. In the distant, sordid past, mankind looked to a slithering reptile for advice as to whether to eat a certain fruit from a tree that had the knowledge of good and evil in it. We as humanity chose to disobey God then, and our track record leaves much to be desired today. The reptile we counseled with has a name. He is Satan, the king of deception. He is the total opposite of Jesus. Where Satan is the deceiver, Jesus is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. Although Jesus is the ultimate king and one day most certainly will be the only king, this earth currently is Satan's domain. It is filled with Satan's attributes, including the sharp divide between mankind and God. All misunderstanding and drawing of incorrect conclusions. All hates or even dislikes we have for others. Jealousy and other misuses of love. Envy and all other ungodly desires and most of all, deception. We do not have to look very far to see that most in this world bow down to its beady-eyed king quite frequently. What does God's word say about lying? From BibleInfo.com, I, I found this about the ninth commandment. The Bible reference Exodus 20.15 says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. 
explanation. This commandment forbids bribery and forgery and even the least suggestion contrary to truth. It forbids libel, slander, and backbiting and calls for the truth and nothing but the truth. In Revelation 22.15, we are told that whoever loves and practices a lie will be outside the gates of the New Jerusalem. And in Revelation 21.27, but there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. We are commanded in the Bible to be truthful, to not tell falsehoods. But in that we live in a world of deception, if we choose to go along with the crowd, we will invariably utter deceptions. We will utter lies. But more importantly, we will believe that lies are true. And we will base our decisions, indeed, our entire thought processes, on lies. Jesus said, whatsoever you believe will come true. In that light, then, what is a lie? Since we live in a land of lies, and over the years from one generation to the next, we have gradually expanded the lies until they have embedded their false and obscenely jagged structures deep into the flesh of society. Is it a lie to counter these societal facts with the truth as Jesus presented it? Is it a lie to tell the truth in a land where the truth is assumed to be a lie? Is it so simple to distinguish the truth from a lie or a lie from the truth? We might laugh at Pontius Pilate's question over 2,000 years ago, but considering all I have said so far, what is truth may not be a bad question after all. Jesus declared himself to be the truth. Are the things he taught us the truth also? Should we pray for our enemies or, or shoot them? When we are engaged in a war, society would declare that the right and proper thing to do would be to shoot them. And Jesus' pray for them would be stricken from the worldly rule book as ridiculous and declared a lie. Let us now attempt to answer Pilate's question, what is truth? Jesus and his teachings are the truth. Treat others as you wish to be treated. Love your enemy and do good to those who would do evil to you. Jesus also commanded that we do not resist evil. Does this mean the truth is we should let our enemies stomp us into the ground? If the truth is Jesus, we need to bless our enemies even with our dying breath. Our enemies are not limited to our nation's enemies. They include irritating neighbors, obnoxious relatives, and insane drivers who tailgate us on the road. What is truth in those situations? Why are we admonished by Jesus to be careful in an uncareful world? Be loving when there appears to be no love. Be thoughtful when no one gives a flying burrito about us. Well, Jesus sees the whole picture and is quite aware that his shaft of light can only penetrate the darkness so far. He needs each of us to shine our light, which is Jesus' light, so that the whole world can redefine truth as Jesus, who is the truth, the way, and the life, and understand that no one comes unto the Father except through him. Yes, 
The truth is Jesus. He gave his life for us. The truth is Jesus. He healed everyone and said even greater things we will do. Yes, hospitals and doctors are needed now. The whole medical complex, though tainted with man's greed, is important now. But we must open up to the truth. We must let a shaft of light into our minds and know that God's healing, even in this convoluted world, is possible and should be striven for. We, who are often so fearful of what our bodies put us through, need to understand our bodies do not own us. We own them. Jesus said to be not afraid. Take your body by the nape of its neck and tell it once and for all you will not be ruled by it. Be determined to accept the truth from Jesus and receive his love and encouragement and his peace of mind instead. Know the truth and be set free. Now, not some future date. Now. The truth is Jesus. Go against the winds of tradition and know the truth. The truth, the truth is Jesus. The title of this writing is The Redemptive Lie. Have you figured out what that is yet? It is from the world's point of view, from the Antichrist, and from it we should lie like we have never lied before. We must lie ourselves out of Satan's clutches, which extends all the way back to Adam and Eve and the fall. Entire civilizations have invented new ways of coping with darkness and none of them recognize the importance of Jesus, the truth, the only truth. We must lie to the world and embrace our Lord and Savior Jesus wholeheartedly. There is no other way. So I don't know if you picked up what the redemptive lie is yet. I'll try to say a little bit more. The redemptive lie is the idea that the, the lies of the world are true and that if we follow the lies of the world, we will be saved, we will be redeemed. That is a lie. We will not be redeemed by the truths the world splashes onto us. The truths the world tries to embed in our hearts and minds and souls can be found on television, can be found on the radio, can be found in the movies. There's a truth that the world is trying to embed into us that is not the truth at all. It is a redemptive lie to believe the world. The true redemption comes only through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so that is what we need. We need the truth. We need not the redemptive lie that the world throws at us, but the redemptive truth that Jesus told us. And we need the truth of, that he has died to save our very souls. He has taken on our sins and... Uh, as we acknowledge that, we are then redeemed, saved. And that is the truth, the real truth, and nothing but the truth. But now what I'd like to do is share a hymn poem. And I'm looking forward to doing that. It is called, today the hymn poem is called Dearest Jesus, draw thou near me. And it is in the public domain. And uh, music today is by Alexander Nakarada called Fantasy Motion. And uh, it is used under the license of Creative Commons. So, enjoy this hymn 
poem created especially for this podcast that has been heard by no one else, only you. So I look forward to sharing it with you. And God bless you. Dear Jesus, draw thou near me. Let thy spirit dwell with mine. Open now my ear to hear thee. Take my heart and seal it thine. Keep me, lead me on my way. Thee to follow and obey. Ere to do thy will and fear thee. And rejoice to know and hear thee. Underneath thy wings abiding in thy church, O Savior dear. Let me dwell in thee confiding. Hold me in thy faith and fear. Take away from me each thought that with wickedness is fraught, tempting me to disobey thee. Root it out, O Lord, I pray thee. Thou earth's greatest joy and gladness and salvation full and free. Let thy presence cheer my sadness and prepare my soul for thee. In the hour when I depart, touch my spirit, lips and heart. With thy word assure uphold me till the heavenly gates enfold 